So while we're on the topic of um, the well-known COVID pandemic, one of the faces that many Norwegians uh, became familiar with uh, through the media was that of senior researcher Gunvai Grødelom. She heads her own research group at uh, the University of Oslo and Oslo University Hospital. In that research, she has developed novel vaccine strategies against influenza and coronaviruses. So uh, please welcome the next speaker, Gunvai Grødelom. We're happy to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm super happy to be here talking to you uh, today. Uh, and I'll actually be touching upon some of my research today. We do a lot of super cool stuff, of course, in my lab. Uh, but today I'm going to focus on uh, some of the vaccines that we have uh, developed. So I'm going to talk uh, about vaccination against future coronavirus and influenza pandemics. Uh, and uh, I think um, preparing for protection against these highly variable viruses makes it a challenge, of course, that you can't really predict which viral variant is likely to cause the next problem. That uh, implies, of course, also that you cannot really, uh, you can't stockpile any vaccines in advance. You have to rely on actually either making a rapid response, rapid development of new variant specific uh, vaccines, very much like we did uh, during the uh, recent uh, SARS CoV 2 pandemic, or you can, as a second uh, solution, develop vaccines able to broadly protect against different viral variants. I think both of these two solutions are uh, great. But I think uh, we should go back to uh, way before uh, the pandemic, uh, kind of, uh, because there have been a number of clinical trials uh, with uh, different vaccines against both different coronaviruses as well as uh, influenza. Uh, and here I've picked up two fairly random uh, examples. Uh, one of them is testing of uh, a new uh, DNA vaccine against uh, MERS and where they used spike inserted into the DNA uh, vaccine. Uh, in the other clinical trial I chose here, they have used uh, mRNA vaccines uh, and where they have uh, developed a vaccine against one of the influenza variants that are presently not circulating in the human population. Both of these uh, trials you will see are from uh, before the pandemic, 2019 and uh, 2017 respectively. Uh, but what really was uh, demonstrated in uh, the pandemic was that we can rapidly mass produce DNA and mRNA vaccines. That's very important to know. Uh, so, uh, now we're coming into uh, one of the things that are similar for these two viruses, because you saw uh, you had hemagglutinin for influenza inserted into the vaccine, and you had spike for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. These are both surface proteins, so the common denominator is that you're forming with these vaccines neutralizing antibodies that can completely or semi-completely prevent infection of uh, your cells after infection. Uh, and that is typically the aim of uh, vaccine uh, development. A challenge is also that these are, of course, uh, specific for a particular viral variant, so that you can't really have protection against many different variants if you're basing your strategy on uh, the surface proteins alone. So now we're coming into uh, my research, because we have also, of course, uh, developed a vaccine that was a bit too late to uh, go into the race in association with the pandemic. But for the uh, past uh, 20, 30 years or so, a challenge for subunit vaccines, whether they are proteins, mRNA or DNA, has been efficacy. So we have known for a number of years that they are safe, 
but they are not really efficient enough to actually form memory responses, form antibody responses after vaccination. So what we uh, have done here is that we have taken again hemagglutinin, as was shown in the previous uh, trials for influenza. We have taken hemagglutinin, the surface protein, and inserted it into this uh, vaccine format here. Uh, what separates this strategy from uh, the other strategies is the yellow part that you see. This yellow part will, after vaccination, direct the vaccine specifically to the immune cells that we have selected. Then these immune cells will present parts uh, of uh, the antigen, the uh, influenza uh, hemagglutinin, to the immune system. You will activate uh, CD4 positive T cells. Uh, and also, since we had the whole surface protein uh, expressed on uh, this vaccine, you can see here as the sun or stars in red, they can be recognized by B cells, leading to development of antibodies as well as T cell responses. Given the recent pandemic and the immunology that has been in the newspapers, you're with me now, right? <laughs> yes, perfect. Uh, so, uh, the advantage of this strategy is that you can direct your vaccine specifically to the immune cells that we think are the most efficient. And if we compare uh, this uh, strategy in uh, black bars here to a similar vaccines where you haven't targeted uh, the uh, selected immune cells in white, you can see that we have a large difference with respect to induction of neutralizing antibodies that we have been so focused on in this pandemic. Now, this is cool, uh, but uh, the results uh, so far uh, that I showed was for uh, influenza H1N1, which is the seasonal influenza that we are experiencing essentially every year. And we don't really need a new vaccine against that. We need a vaccine against pandemic influenza or potentially pandemic influenza. So what we did was that we used the same vaccine strategy, but now we used uh, the surface protein of influenza H7N9, which is what we typically call a bird flu uh, virus, uh, and uh, that has horrible mortality rates, typically in the range of 20 to 90 percent, depending on uh, which uh, strain uh, it is, uh, when they hit uh, humans. As of today, this virus uh, will almost every year infect uh, people in Asia predominantly, uh, and then uh, after a transmission directly from birds. So there's no human to human interaction with this virus, has never been, so that's good. Uh, but we should be ready uh, with such a high mortality rate the day it's actually needed, and this virus acquires the ability for human to human transmission. Uh, that's what we did uh, here, or hopefully, uh, with the vaccine. Uh, and you see uh, that in ferrets, which uh, is uh, the gold standard model for influenza vaccine research, crazily enough, uh, that in uh, the blue bars we are raising after a single vaccination, neutralizing antibodies in ferrets. And this is for influenza considered a good um, model that will also indicate what would happen in humans after vaccination. So that's good. Uh, but that's antibody responses, uh, and we have also, uh, these poor ferrets have been uh, challenged with a lethal dose of uh, this bird flu influenza. That's very nice. Uh, but what it demonstrates is quite important, because what it demonstrates is that after vaccination, we can actually protect these ferrets completely from uh, symptomatic disease. Uh, that is really important. So this uh, same uh, vaccine we are presently uh, developing for a phase one clinical trial. We are at this stage recruiting uh, people, uh, so we are hoping that uh, the results will be as nice as they have been in uh, larger and smaller animals. In either case, this is a vaccine I've been working on for the past 10 years. So if the clinical trial goes well, I'm super happy. If it does not go well, you know what? Then I have, in either case, brought this vaccine from development and to clinical testing, and I'm done, you know? So uh, <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to getting this uh, trial ongoing. Uh, 
my vaccine here, similar to the ones I uh, demonstrated um, firstly uh, when I started talking against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza, are based on neutralizing antibodies, aiming for specific protection against a particular strain. But to only consider neutralizing antibodies is to <laughs> dramatically underestimate the protective power of antibodies. An antibody is not just an antibody. It really is not. In addition to uh, neutralization, antibodies can, uh, in essence, recognize uh, a different part of a pathogen, target it for destruction, get it out of our body, much like uh, T cells uh, can do. And these antibodies we do not talk about. And the reason we don't talk about them is because they cannot prevent the initial infection. They cannot prevent mild disease, typically. Well, sometimes they can, but they are most important for prevention of severe disease. Uh, and that uh, kind of brings me uh, to the next point, because uh, we should also, in addition to my supercall vaccine and many other strategies that are aiming for rapid protection against a particular virus variant, we should also develop broadly protective vaccines against these variable viruses. Uh, and then uh, what we should do to that end is to include more antigens than just the surface proteins. Because we know that the surface proteins of these viruses, these are the most immunogenic. No, uh, most immunogenic, yes, but they're also the most mutagenic. They change a lot. The more uh, internal parts of a virus will not change as rapidly. And as such, you can actually get uh, vaccines that will award broad protection against many different variants. The problem is that if you are focusing only on T cell responses and antibody responses against other parts than the surface proteins, you will not get the vaccine that will protect against uh, mild disease, quite likely. But it will protect against severe disease. So we actually have to choose which uh, strategy uh, to go for as a society. <coughs> So I'm now just going to show a teaser uh, for another one uh, of the vaccines that we have uh, in my lab uh, and where we have actually put together a vaccine that should provide broad protection against both influenza and uh, different coronaviruses. Uh, and our starting point was to uh, make the vaccine so that it would raise these specific antibodies against both the surface proteins of influenza and spike on uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, as well as you see an antibody called anti-NA, that's the other surface protein on uh, influenza, overlooked, it's neuraminidase. Uh, and in addition to these broader types of antibodies, we aim for raising strong T-cell immunity against a lot of internal virus components. So these vaccines will uh, similar to the vaccines that uh, we presently are developing for use in society. They will have these neutralizing antibodies and will protect against infection uh, against these specific viral variants. But in addition, also form a protective layer against severe disease should one of the non-expected variants emerge to cause the next pandemic. And the thing is, we have no idea which virus will cause the next pandemic, but it is quite likely that it will be an influenza uh, or corona variant. That said, we have been waiting for uh, the influenza pandemic for at least uh, 20 years, has not come yet, so you know, who knows? But still, it represents the most likely alternative. So if I'm uh, going to try uh, sum up the future uh, pandemic prevention that we can do uh, with respect to future vaccine development, I think we should continue to aim for a uh, rapid response uh, where we are developing vaccines quite rapidly that can uh, protect against the specific virus, virus that actually comes along. Uh, and I think uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was quite important because this was indeed the first time that both mRNA and DNA vaccines were licensed for human use. It's not so talked about uh, in Europe, but in India they started using the first DNA vaccine ever. 
So we have learned uh, a lot on how to market these vaccines, how to produce them during the pandemic, and that is very important because that forms a whole different starting point during the next pandemic as compared to what we had available of uh, industrial uh, factories that could actually produce these and etc. the logistics compared to what we started with the last time. But one of the things that we have really not learned a lot about during the pandemic is immunology. And immunology, as an immunologist, is really the underlying thing uh, for every vaccine development. We have learned surprisingly little uh, about how we should meet and make a vaccine against a virus we have not met before. We know very little about how our immune responses would be against a new virus or which part of that virus we actually should target. We know that it worked very well for SARS-CoV-2 and works for influenza to target uh, the surface proteins, but we also know there are many viral families where this will not work. How do we make efficient vaccines against this? We do not know. So what we need to do is do a lot of research into the correlates of protection, that is what type of immune response will actually protect against the given virus. Uh, based on uh, such knowledge, we really can uh, develop vaccines that will also induce broad protection against um, essentially anything. So there's still a lot to learn is I think uh, my main message. We have gotten somewhere, but uh, in order to fully be prepared for the next uh, pandemic, we need to go basic. We need to understand the underlying foundations for immunity. And based upon that knowledge, really specifically tailor vaccines to whichever end it is that we desire. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.